Well, good afternoon, and thank you all so much for coming. It's Friday, and uh, it's raining, and we didn't have a faculty meeting, so I'm really, really uh, glad to see you here. Um, students, raise your hand. We've got students here. Yes. The faculty, raise your hand. Yes. Great. So we've got students and faculty in uh, a mix, and so I've got these little green sheets, and I'd like for you to ignore my columns because they aren't evenly distributed. So that, you know, I'm trying not to let that bother me too much. Uh, but it just tells you what to write. I want your name, your email address, whether you are a faculty or a student. And I think we have a visiting scholar. Uh, yeah, yeah. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. What is your name? Uh, your name? Yeah. Ben. 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 Oh, thank you. Yeah, very nice to meet you. Uh, so we're welcome. welcome. Oh, thank you. So, uh, and program. So if you could put those things, and that way I kind of know who to let know who was here. So, start that over here and over here. here. Thank you. So I do have some handouts for you. Um, the guided notes um, I created because some of the faculty um, want um, their students to turn these in and if you are watching this video on YouTube then you will need to find the attachment for the guided notes to give to your um, instructor so Dr. Hogan is going to pass those out and um, you just go ahead and give them to everybody and if they want to use them they can um, today we're going to be talking about how the ed tpa helps our teacher candidates recognize the diverse learners in their classroom plan for the diverse learners in their classroom instruct them and assess them and oftentimes our students struggle with this and so my uh, goal today is to help the students that are here realize just how easy this is and it's to also help the faculty that's here today understand uh, what kinds of things you can be giving your students in order to help them when they come and ask you about this so let's take a look um, if you take a look at these rubrics, you can see 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 15. Now there's just rubrics 1 through 15. There's not, and I left out 4 and 14, which really could be added because you, you uh, look at diverse learn, uh, language needs there. So actually that is almost every single rubric in some way you have to address different learning needs and a, a, a diverse population so uh, it's a big deal usually this is what makes the difference between people who are making a three solid and those who want to go up to making a four and a five so when I look at scores across programs and I see it flatlining at three it's easy for me to think okay what's going on here is probably they're not um, applying what they've learned about uh, the diverse classrooms and uh, they're probably not making the connections they need to make so we spend a lot of time talking about theory and that's really important and on about two rubrics <laughs> okay and I, I'm not saying it's not important because you have to explain yourself over and over and over again. You have to make connections over and over and over again. But I'm seeing a little imbalance there. Because I know my teacher candidates are, are very well versed on theory. They can write the rationale. But they have no idea how to write down guided notes as support. So this is, this is what we, we have that's a problem. All right, so I'm the Ed TPA coordinator. If you don't know who I am, my name is Terrell Rock. I'm also a clinical instructor for secondary education. 
I, I got this job as Ed TBA coordinator because I'm the only idiot here in the whole building who likes Ed TBA as much as I do. And so uh, I got, they said, you want to do this? I yes, because somehow or another it fascinates me. I don't know why. I'm probably going to have karma hit me for that, but uh, I, I do think it is a good assessment. It is the Ed and Ed TPA. Do you know what that stands for? Nope. It's not education. That is a good guess. Thank you. I always thought of that. Yeah. Do you know what it is? Ed you. Ed you. Educative. What? This is a new piece of information for me. I didn't know it either until just like in the last month or two. Educative. And as I was reading something and it was like, oh man, that makes so much sense because I don't know how many times uh, on their way out of the program our students say, well, I really learned a lot from doing the TPA. So even though it's an assessment and it assesses uh, what they've learned in their programs. <clears throat> and by the way, we're way ahead of national and state norms, so we're doing great. So even though it's it's way up there, we have, um, they do learn while they're doing it. So it, that's what that stands for. And I thought maybe you'd like to know. TPA is Teacher Performance Assessment. Educative Teacher Performance Assessment. So equity in the classroom. As I said, our, uh, often our candidates struggle with this, and it's unfortunate because it affects four out of the five rubrics. And it's also what keeps them from making the four and the five on the rubrics. And one of the misconceptions that we have is that when we talk about diverse learners, we're only talking about IEP, 504, and ESL. And even after I have discussed this in my secondary ed classroom, <coughs> my, my students, they will get to where they're applying that, that I've told them, and they're filling out that part of the lesson plan where they have to write supports for the steps for the students, and they're like, well, I don't have any IEPs or 504s. And I'm like, okay, let's go back to what we talked about in class, because we're not talking about special needs when we say diversity. Now there are, how many of us are, there's mm, 9, 10, 15. 15 people in here and 15 completely different people. If I were in here, I would probably be close to being checked out because I can't listen unless I'm just really interested in the topic or if there's something to read along with it or if there's guided notes. So I can listen with support. And these are the types of things we're talking about. We're talking about people, the different ways they, they learn and helping everyone be successful. So you have to think about, about this because we have students who go to university school and they'll say, Ms. Rock or Dr. Hogan, I go, I'm teaching university school and we don't have any special needs. We don't, we don't have anything to put down for diversity. Like, really? They have cookie cutter kids over there? Somebody took a cookie cutter and made all the children the same. I just see it with gingerbread man everywhere. So that's not, that's not what we need to think about. So there are no cookie cutter classrooms. Children are all completely different. Teenagers are completely different. And even adults are. We are teaching a content. We're teaching students. And I love this because it is a focus that is in the ed TPA. Yes, you have to be strong in your content. You have to be able to make those connections. But over and over and over again, the focus of the ed TPA turns to the student. Even in task two, they are not at all interested in how well you can do direct instruction or how well you can give instruction. They are only interested in how engaged your students are. And so it's always about the student. And so you have to recognize that they all have different needs. So, true or false, accommodations should only be made for those students with IEPs or 504s. True or false? false. Correct, that is false. You can only do the things that are listed in the IEPs. False. And this is one I come across all the time. 
But Miss Rock, my mentor told me we can only do it if it's I have to follow just the IEP. Can't do anything else. I'm like, really? <laughs> and I, I get so sick of my mentor said. And they may have said that. I'm not saying they didn't, but they're wrong. And that's why we can't keep putting new uh, educated people out in the field. So no, that is false. Uh, okay, it takes special training to know what to do to help kids with their learning problems. True or false? False. Does not take special training. If I am going by here and I drop this next to you, and I can't pick it up, what are you going to do? Will you do that, please? Because my back is really bad. Yes, I don't have a sign on me that says my back is really bad, but I've got my hair. <laughs> How did you know to do that? Did you read it in a book? <laughs> no, you didn't. So this is the thing that's important. You have to relax, students. Relax. How can you help your students? That's what you need to ask the question. What are they doing? How can they help them? Stop, get out of the mindset that there is a perfect prescription. I know when I was at teaching first grade, one of my best friends put her son in my classroom because she was sure I could teach him to read. Guess what? Despite my best efforts, and doing everything I knew to do, worrying about it, trying everything, he still left my classroom not on grade level. Because there was no perfect answer for that student. So it is just a matter of trying the different strategies. There isn't a perfect answer. And so relax and stop thinking that that's what we're looking for. Um, you want to is it true or false? Giving students support prevents them from getting ready for college. False. <laughs> Please say false. This is this is a cop out of some high school uh, high school teachers. I'm sorry, it's a cop out. I'm not going to give them that because they they're going to college next year. Are you sure they're going to college next year? Because if they don't learn this year, I don't think they're going to make it to college next year. So you have to keep your short-term goals in mind. And those short-term goals are laid out by your objectives. What is your objective for this lesson and how are you going to help students reach that objective? So don't be dissuaded there. Differentiation takes time that teachers don't really have. True or false? That is false. Because it's really an easy thing. The Ed TPA wants you to think about two things, varied learning needs, and diverse learners, not quite the same. Because we talk about diversity, we can talk about a lot of things with people. We're gonna talk in that, we're gonna go over that. And then varied learning needs is a little bit different. You can consider the IEPs and 504s and you should and you must in the, in the uh, EdTPA. Specific language needs. Now, if you came to the academic language section, you know that when we think about language needs, we're thinking about listening, speaking, reading, writing, performing, language, language needs. A lot of people have trouble with one of those five. And that doesn't mean they have to go see a speech teacher or if they're going to a special reading teacher, but it means that they might need some support, support in those areas. Needing greater challenge or support. I always say to my students, I ask them, what is the greatest wasted resource in the United States? You know, anybody want to guess? Human. Human resource is the greatest resource that's <laughs> greatest wasted resource. How many of you have taught a class where you have got three or four really smart kids who don't have what grit or support or whatever they need to be able to use their intellect to its full potential? 
and you see that over and over and over again. That is a tremendously wasted human, think about it as a resource, what we could do with that. So we want to make sure that we're giving those students their challenge and the support that they need. We have lots of students that struggle with reading, and we have lots of underperforming students, and those that have gaps in academic knowledge. So a gap comes about from why? Why would we have academic gaps? Kids move from one school to another. Yeah. They move from one school to the other, different curriculum, different pacing. What else? Because they're actually opportunity gaps. Yes. Opportunities. What else? Home life. Home life. Home life. Kids learn to cope without doing the work. Like yeah. They can't read. They learn yeah. coping skills. They learn how to sit and smile and look like they're listening when they're not. Mm -hmm. So they can actually be there. But those of you who are in the classroom right now, residency one, do you have students with attendance problems? Yes. Those students give you a daily challenge of making up the academic gap from just yesterday. So we always have academic gaps. So lots of things to think about. Students that are underperforming, greater need of challenge, those who miss a lot of school, those who struggle with reading. Uh, for example, do you ever seen a student that's better at explaining something orally than in writing? That's a specific need. The difference between equality and equity. Now, in a perfect world, there wouldn't be a barrier. There'd be no barrier. But unfortunately, we're not in a perfect world. We're in a world that has lots of barriers. So. Equality would mean in your classroom that you're giving everybody the same thing. Equity means that you're giving everybody what they need to have the same opportunity. This is giving everybody the same thing, and this is giving everybody what they need to have the same opportunity. It's a significant difference. So you want to be able to use a variety of strategy to make sure that every student has the best opportunity possible to learn the material. You want to differentiate not by giving everybody their own little individualized IEP lesson plan, but by using a variety of strategies that are going to get to a lot of learners. So, I love this. Y'all know Jerry Brooks? Yes. Okay. What, the reason I show this is because it, it helps you start to think about what differentiation really is. I've just come from my favorite store, the Dollar Tree, and I have some suggestions for a party if you would like to have some educators over to your house this summer. They got some great ideas. They got these pineapple cups, these coconut cups. You could have a Hawaiian theme party, but I have an even better suggestion that's gonna blow your mind. You can get these great cups at, at the Dollar Tree, and I know what you're thinking, that's just a red Solo cup. Let me show you something. Boom, they have a different size. Wait one more time, boom. Differentiation party. You can meet the needs of all your party goers. Some people just need a regular size drink. Some people don't need that much to drink. Some people need a big old drink. You can meet the needs of all your party goers with these great red solar cup from the Dollar Tree. Think about all the possibilities at your differentiation party. You can differentiate the food. You can have some wings, some barbecue wings, a little bit spicy. For those that don't like spicy, you could have some honey barbecue wings. For those that need some extra spice, you can have some of them five alarm Tabasco wings. You can differentiate the heat in your wings. You can have some meatballs, and you can meet the needs of those that don't eat red meat by having turkey balls. You can meet your party goers' needs by having some tofu balls for those that are vegetarian. I like the tofu balls. You can even differentiate your dip. You can make one of them seven layer dips with the refried beans and the salsa and the onions and cheeses. You can differentiate, make a six layer dip maybe leave out the onions then you can make an eight layer dip maybe add some extra festive cheese you can even differentiate the time of your party 
you could have your party from 7 to 9, invite all the fun people from 7 to 9, but you could actually invite the wild, crazy people from 6 to 9 because they can handle some extra time. <laughs> then you could just invite the fun people a little bit boring that can't handle a big old long party. You could do them from 8 to 9. You could even differentiate the time of your party. I'm telling you, there's a lot of things you can do with your differentiation party. Starting out with these great cups from the Dollar Trees. Go out, you get you some, you're going to be the talk of all the teachers at your differentiation party. So one of the things that I think happened, because you know, I was in the public schools for a long time, and I remember when people started using this word differentiation. And, you know, all my colleagues were just like panicking. I can't believe they think I can do this because I don't have never had any special education training. I don't know what to do with those kids, and I don't have any idea how to teach them, and I don't think they ought to be in my room. And so they put up a big fuss about it, and some of them still do. Uh, and some of them just let them sit there. And there's a lot of things that go on. And I think it's because no one empowered them. And Jerry Brooks, it's just plain common sense. If they need a small cup, give them a small cup. And if they need a big one, give them a big one. It's just common sense. But they put these big words on there, and then they come up with these other things. They talk about modifications, accommodations. And everybody's thinking, well, what's the difference in my accommodation or modification, differentiation? And then Ed TPA says supports. Thank you, Ed TPA, because it is just all support if I'm hurting my friends come and do what support me right and they didn't have to have special training for it so it's just a matter of using common sense and that's what we want you to do in the classroom is use some common sense and we know you got it do they use those <clears throat> supports word like significantly or are they they get yes. interchangeable within the no. text they only use, use support. So then in the language when students are writing, are we like, are they scored down if they use the word differentiation versus no, support? No, they, they aren't. Okay. Um, no. So they can still use the language? They can, okay. yeah. Um, and there is some, some differences, but it really doesn't matter. What they want to know is how these students are able to um, make their classroom, well think about scale. Do you all know what the E stands for in scale? You want to guess? E in scale stands for equity. This was made by scale. They love equity. They're all about equity. They've got they've got so many so much stuff, webinars and stuff on equity. Yeah. So it's it's a big deal. So it, it's about equity and they want to make all of it available to everybody. Everybody's got equal opportunity to learn, have the same experience. That's what equity is. All right, so a lot of this stuff you already use. This is differentiation, modification, accommodations. In other words, what the ed TPA wants to know, support. Now, if you teach special ed, you'd have to write IEPs and you have to think about. But general educators, supports. Raise your hand if you have used shoulder partners when you teach, or if you've been in a classroom and used them. Um, guided notes. That's my favorite one. Uh, preferential seating. What does that mean? Yes, you choose their seats. It's a nice way of sitting bad boy sits, saying bad boy sits here. <laughs> preferential. He's got reserved seating. <laughs> Uh, thank pair share uh, analogies stories examples apparently that's one I like mnemonics so when I taught civics everybody learned the uh, preamble by singing at schoolhouse rock mm -hmm. and because they were middle schoolers and embarrassed I gave them all Groucho Marx glasses and somehow or another, if they put on Groucho Marx class, uh, glasses and sang it in a Mickey Mouse voice, they weren't afraid to sing it. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> 
Matter of fact, we would go to other classrooms and sing the preamble song with our Groucho Marx classes. Right, whatever. It worked. I just, whatever it takes, right? And so that was a support. The Groucho Marx classes and letting them use a Mickey Mouse voice was a support. The preamble song was a support. The learning goal was to memorize the preamble. So those are all things we already use. So if you're using these, which I know you are, relax. Write them down. Now, this is interesting. There's a differentiation continuum. You don't let that word bother you. Pretend it says something easier. Differentiation party continuum. <laughs> so at a not differentiated classroom, the assessment is always at the end. There's only one type of assessment. Teacher directs student behavior. Instruction is whole class. Coverage of text and curriculum drive instruction. Intelligence is viewed narrowly. Time is inflexible. Teacher solves the problem. All of it. This is not differentiated. Fully is the opposite. Now, I think you've got this handout, right? Mm -hmm. So take a minute and look at it. And especially for those of you who are teaching in Residency 1, see if you can pinpoint where you think your mentor's classroom is on that continuum. And this is Carol Ann Tomlinson, who I adore. Those of you all who need a name to write down for your ed TPA, Carol Ann Tomlinson. <laughs> Somebody look up. Okay, uh, Logan, where do you think your uh, mentor teacher is? Close to fully differentiated. Boy, that's impressive. Uh, Morgan, where would yours be? Um, she's about in the middle. About in the middle. And that's where a lot of, a lot of us are. Mm -hmm. As a brand new teacher, where do you think you're going to be? <laughs> she said in trouble. <laughs> Most of you are going to be about right in here. And how? what you need to do to improve is change one or two things every year. And if you don't get yourself stuck in a, a rut, as you get better, you can add more and more things to get you here. So the teachers who are here are people who did not stop reflecting on their practice. And they continue to look for ways to improve their practice. There's what we call low prep differentiation and high prep differentiation. Do you have this? Okay. High prep would be interest centers, uh, tiered activities in labs, learning contracts. What is format? I'm sorry? Format, M-A-T. I do not know. Okay. Yeah. But these are what we think of as high prep differentiation. Oh. And I would not suggest these because you probably have 30 students and you're trying to keep your head above water. I would instead suggest that you concentrate on using low prep differentiation more often. It is better to use low prep differentiation more often than to use high prep differentiation once a grading period, which is about all you would be able to do. Now, as you become a more experienced teacher, you can keep doing your low prep differentiation with every single lesson that you teach and start to add these in. Interest centers are probably something that your elementary folks are gonna have anyway. So you already have that there. And you start to add these in year, you know, try to add them in one or two a semester as you become more experienced. It's trying to kill yourself. It's not going to let you be like me and retire after 30 years, okay, with a pension 
and then you go across the state line and get another job. I tell you, that's a good gig. But you won't last if you wear yourself out. So it's good to think of low prep more often, high prep, start adding in as you become more experienced. That's my opinion. Differentiation. So we differentiate by using a variety of strategies. So when I taught civics and when I taught U.S. history or whatever I was teaching, I just assumed that any kind of learner was in my class. There was going to be kids who didn't listen, some who had academic gaps, some who were really bright and on it, some who were really bright and not on it. I had every, I just assumed every kind of learner was there. So I taught in a way to reach as many different learners as possible just knowing that if I was very eclectic in my style, that would be able to reach more learners. And I think that that's the kind of variety of strategy that you can do. If you really want to get down to the nitty gritty about supports, when we're thinking about differentiating or supporting students, we have to think about what we're teaching. We think about the content, what we teach, we think about the process, how we teach, and then we consider the product, how students demonstrate learn, uh, learning. Most of the time, people immediately go to this. They say, well, we'll give them more time on the assignment. Um, or we'll let them have the assignment read to them. So they go immediately to the product and think about how to change or support the making of the product. When really, you could do content. Might be, if you've got some severe issues, like if you have a student in your classroom who is non-English speaking, you're not going to expect them to be able to recite the preamble and understand it. So you have to think about your content, process, and product. We're also thinking about all these different groups. Content, process, and product. That's how you can think about when you're, when you're drawing a blank onto how to support your students, think, okay, what would help them with content? Thank you. Uh, what would help them with process or with product? All right. I have any early childhood people in here? Any early childhood? Okay. Do I have any? I have elementary folks, right? Yes, if you're elementary, uh, faculty or student, you can come get one of these. This is elementary literature and this is elementary math. All elementary folks can come get these. Get what one. Just get one, math or literature, doesn't matter. Unless you know for sure which one you're going to be doing for the day. Literature. Literature. Do we have any special education in here? Special ed? Middle grades. Middle grades, here we go. It's ELA. So I didn't I didn't try to do one for every single handbook. I'll do middle grades. I've got uh and then secondary you can look at the body. Okay, then I've got Secondary Ed, ELA, and this is Secondary Ed Science, Science ELA. This is why I wanted people to sign up. Yes. <laughs> okay. Science, this is Science, that's ELA. Has everybody got one? 
What do you need? Special ed or? Science. Science. There you go. Yes. Secondary ed science. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what we're going to be doing is, is looking at prompts and rubrics at this point. Prompt two and prompt three help you in describing the diversity of your classroom and then planning for your diverse learners. So this is prompt two. All prompt twos, and you don't have the prompts with you, but they're in your handbook. This is knowledge of students to inform teaching. Notice that they talk about prior academic learning and prerequisite skills personal, cultural, and community assets as related to the central focus. Um, then you justify, okay, let's look right here. So what you have to do is that you have to identify the prerequisite skills and knowledge. So you might need to assess students' prior knowledge and prerequisite skills. You need to know your students their everyday experiences, their cultural backgrounds and practices, their language backgrounds and practices, and their interests. Now, once you have described your learners, then you talk about how you're going to support them. So you plan specific strategies, supports, adaptations to address all of these things. Prerequisite skills all of these things. I'm sorry, yeah. So all the stuff that you described here, you talk about that. And then you talk, you try to anticipate their errors and misconceptions and that's how you get a five. Okay. So 2A, you're describing their prior academic learning and prerequisite skills. And so now in 3A, you justify how that prior academic learning guided your choice of learning tasks. You have described in 2B the personal, cultural, community assets related to a central focus, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute. And here you justify how your understanding of that guided your choice of learning tasks or adaptation of them. So what in the heck are personal, cultural, and community assets? What's an asset? So it's not quite the same thing as a personality trait. It's, it's a positive thing. So what do you know about your students' personal interests and activities outside of school that can help you plan relevant lessons? So if you're teaching um, uh, something on science and you know that your students are interested in things scientific when they're not in school, is that interest related to what you're teaching in this uh, learning segment. What do you know about the students' culture? Does Appalachia have a culture? Yes. yes. Um, is the culture of Johnson City different from that of Bristol? Yes. Uh, what are some things in your community that would be considered assets? So if you, we have the Gray Fossil Site, Sycamore Shoal, we have a hands-on museum, or we did. Do we still have it's 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 right. Okay. <laughs> We've got a plethora of, of cultural, uh, many things. So you think about the museums, the historical sites, the parks, the universities, the libraries. Those are all community and cultural assets. You can't just start listing them, though. I bet Dr. Hogan can tell us what we need to pay attention to when we're picking them. Wow, uh, your central focus. That's right, your central focus. So if you're if you're teaching about alligators, then you might talk about the gray fossil site. If you can look at the skeletal remains of other animals and vertebrae, 
Yeah, 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 that kind of thing. I'm not a science person. Um, but you wouldn't talk about um, sycamore shoals. Let's say you had alligators there now. Okay. So it has to fit in with what you're teaching. So it takes some thinking, but you're making connections because this is what makes your lessons relevant. It keeps your students from asking that annoying question of why do I need to know this? Besides the fact we want you to be educated, then you know that may not mean anything to them. But why do they need to know it? So you make it relevant and it creates more interest. You're making it more personal and you're teaching it to them now. So you're not just describing your class, but you're designing your lessons for those class, that class, and that's why we say that you're teaching students, not content. So, what is required of the canon? So they need to identify the prerequisite skills and knowledge. They need to know their students. So they might want to give a pretest. They might need to look at previous test scores, observations, records, talk to other teachers. But you can't just say when you're writing, you can't just say, my students know this without giving evidence. You see all those things up there? This is Dr. Hogan's undergraduate secondary ed class. And they're talking about how to write for the ed TPA, making a claim, citing the evidence and bringing in the reasoning. This is exactly what you need to do. And so, thank you, Dr. Hogan. You're <laughs> and so, you have to say how you know what the students can do. How do you know that? Could be because you observed them. If so, you need to say so. Grading their work during residency one is or of students like them is a real good way to get a, a feeling for, a, for what they can do and who can do that and who struggles and all of that. So that's the I agree. Way. So looking through students work is a viable way. There's, that's qualitative evidence that you're looking through. So it's, it's, it's good. Knowing your students. How do you find out about the everyday experiences? Well, they're cultural interest surveys, about me activities. Conversations with students, talking with mentor and other school personnel, talk to other teachers. I was never very good at finding out information from students because um, somehow or another, some of the students thought I was scary. <laughs> what? <laughs> so they wouldn't open up to me. So I'd go down the hall and I'd talk to Amy Stevenson, who you, we're friends with. And she knew everything about every student because they all told her everything. So if I wanted to know what was going on in somebody's life, I'd go talk to them. And uh, that is a, that's perfectly a, a great way to collect information. But you want to find out what's going on in their life. Don't wait until the end of the year to find out this person has got this really cool hobby that you had no idea. It's this great thing to find out earlier. And you can do that with a lot of about me activities, especially in elementary. Um, recognizing a variety of learners. Learning preference, inventory, anecdotal information from other faculty, anecdotal notes on feedback to students, work samples, IEPs, bio other records. Lots of things. The gist of this, you need to think of strategies to collect information to find out about your students. Those of you who are EPP, I mean, excuse me, faculty, um, you need to give them some assignments or talk about this, you know, uh, and bring that into your lessons. It's not hard to do. Uh, when they have a field experience, how can you help them think about who they're teaching and find out about who they're teaching? I give my students in residency one a knowledge of students assignment. And they have, it's just very simple. They open a Word document. They put the name of every student in the class and they write down everything they know about that student, who they sit with at lunch, what club they're in, anything they can find out. And sometimes what they find out is that they don't know them as well as they need to. And that's a good thing to know. And so they have to find that information. So this is the 
uh, prompt two and three, which is scored by rubric two and rubric three. So rubric two and three score prompt two and three for most of you, not for everybody, but for most of you. And this is where it talks about plan supports. Notice that if you do not attend to the requirements in the IEPs and 504, it's an automatic one. You want to make sure that your supports um, address the needs of specific individuals or groups with similar needs. So this is, again, does this have to be IEP and 504 students? No. No. It does not. Uh, can its justification uh, is missing or represents a deficit view? Does anybody know what deficit view means? My students come from poor homes and their families are not interested in education and they have trouble behaving and they don't do very well and blah, blah, blah. I get it. All the time. Yep. A deficit view is when a teacher candidate is viewing the student mostly through a perceived deficit. How they perceive the student. They're looking the, at the student through a negative light. Most of the time, to the teacher candidate, they're surprised that that's a negative view. To in their mind, they're being realistic. But they're using it as a cop-out. My students could learn if they didn't come from such poor homes. Where are they in that mix? Where's the teacher there? So we, that's an automatic one. So that's something you have to be really careful about. You're talking about your student's assets. Uh, prior academic learning. So if you get a three, they can talk about justifying what they've done, their supports, uh, uh, based on prior academic learning or personal cultural community assets. But to get a four, they need to do prior academic learning, personal cult, and the assets, and make connections, research, or theory. But this is down here because it's considered a secondary thing. And to get a five, then research and theory pops up here, and it's got to be very strong connection. So you can't just say, Marzano said this, so I said that. You've got to make a strong connection to justify what you've done. How can we phrase our connection of theory to data that we've collected like an interest survey? What would be the best way to phrase that on a, on a lesson? So you can just simply say that you learned this about your students by doing an interest survey. Mm -hmm. And then and then explain how that um, made you think about what you were doing, perhaps change what you were doing, add some things to what you were doing. So again, you're thinking about content. How can the content be modified? Process, how can I support them while they're learning? Could I differentiate how the, the content, uh, excuse me, process? Um, product, could I differentiate the way in which I assess the learning? Are there supports? And you're thinking about whole class, special groups, or individuals. So this is just an example of how you can use content, process, and product to think through your lessons with a diverse group. Thank you. I didn't get it here. So this is what you're looking at. So let's say, and I'm sorry to use so many history examples, but it is what I taught. So I don't want to sound like someone who's completely <laughs> out of it. So when I taught the Holocaust in seventh to U.S. history, sixth grade, I taught the Holocaust, the entire content, to everybody. There was no need and no reason in that particular group that I had to modify the content. However, I did have some struggling readers who would need some modification or some support with the process. And I had unmotivated learners who would need help with the process and an IEP. 
students. Now, an IEP student, even though you must address the IEP, that doesn't mean that's all you can do. You can do, you can address the IEP, and you can do the other stuff too. So I think that's how that misconception gets there. People say you must address the IEP, so it's like that's all you can do. That's a minimum. And actually addressing the IEP in 504 on the ETPA, you know what that gets you? A two. Addressing the IEP in 504 gets you a two because that is considered the minimum that a teacher does. Everybody, even a beginning teacher, should be doing more than that, and that's how you come up with a proficient three. Okay? So, look at what I'm doing for everybody. What I might add into my lesson, and I'm not just going to give get guided notes to some of my students. I'm going to give them to everybody. Why not? Even though I'm giving them to the whole class in order to help my struggling readers and my unmotivated learners and probably my IEP students, that is a support I'll hand out to everybody so that people don't feel uncomfortable. And if they don't want to use them, they don't have to, the, the students who aren't struggling, but they're there. And it still counts. I think that's something that you all get confused on, students. You think that because you give it to everybody that it doesn't count as a support, but it does. It counts because the purpose of it, what is the purpose of the guided notes? For you to waste paper or to support the learners? So everything counts. Um, small group discussions. Well. We're going to do that with everybody. It still counts as a support. High interest photos and videos, preferential seating, all these types of things. Now when you've got um, a choice of product, you can get yourself into a whole lot of worry and problems. I wouldn't actually suggest that until later when you become more confident in your teaching. But for some you have to. You have to address the IEP. Yeah. Um, sometimes uh, choice of product works better with formative assessment. Yes, it does. Okay. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. It is and exactly right because if you're talking about a summative, then they've got to be some. There's got it's got to be equivalent. So like if you're having your secondary ed class. Some make a PowerPoint and or some are going to do an essay and some are going to do a presentation. How do you make that equivalent? And so it becomes difficult in that way. So it's a good point that the formative might be easier. Um, and when you're thinking about your supports, think about who they're for. But even though it's, you're giving it to the whole class, it might be prepared because you have an IEP student who needs them. Um, you've got the graphic organizers, learning partners, you're going to let the whole class use them, but they're really there for the struggling readers. So make sure you know, because that's one of the things that you have to say in your ed TPA. Why do you have those learning partners, the graphic organizers? Who are those targeted toward? So when we look, we've already looked at task one prompt four in academic language, but I just want to point out that it is full of this. Um, when you get to the part that really counts, the supports, it's all about how you support language, not about how well you teach it. It's how well you support their language use. So that's how we come up with the general, the targeted, and it gets kind of confusing, but this is what it means. General are going to be those things that are available all the time. A targeted support. This is where you could write, in order to support vocabulary, I will. In order to support discourse. That sentence stem helps you keep your focus.
sit and stem is very useful in your lesson plans and in your ETPA. And you've got individual supports. An individual, by the way, is an individual. That means one. But you can have groups of individuals also. But if you're talking about an individual, make sure you are describing an individual. I get that a lot. <laughs> Task 1, Prompt 5 has to do with supporting assessments. So you want to monitor the learning of a diverse class. And so in your prompt five, they're going to ask you to explain how the design or adaptation of your planned assessments allows students with specific needs to demonstrate their learning. That means you're going to explain how your assessments that you planned, how do they help different kinds of students? perform, show their performance. That's what you're doing and you have to think about English language learners, students with poor spatial skills, all that. And they've got this in your handbook to remind you. And this is the rubric for it. So the teacher, you must address the assessment requirements for the 504s and IEPs um, to get a 5 you must have assessments that are strategically designed to assess individuals or groups with specific needs. That's a five. We're going for a three. Now, you get fives, we're happy, and we jump up and down and say yay, but what we want you to be is proficient. Three. Very few people get fives. Very, very few. So I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying that you're not really expected to. This is what we could, this is, this is an emerging educator, this is a proficient educator, and this is an advanced beginning teacher. So you're not really expected to be there. So remember, because I, I was talking about how difficult that was. Um, evidence is found in task one, prompt five, your context for learning and the assessment artifacts. When we talk about artifacts, those are the things that you actually, you know, you've got your actual copy of the assessments. Here's some more. How can I strategically design my assessments? You all have this, don't you? In your first, first packet that I gave you when you first came in. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> you might want it. But these are these are just some things that you can think about. These are again low prep. I think I forgot to didn't get the, the uh, other side copy. Is what happened. Um, these are low prep. You can have answers dictated, uh, oral testing, um, provide study guides prior to test. That's something we do all the time in secondary. That's a that's a support. Um, so these are some ideas that you can do that aren't a big deal, a way to support, not come up with an entirely different assessment for each student or each group of students, but just a way to support that. I'll let you all take a minute to write some of those down if you want to. want to take a picture of it the students really might want to do that and, and it's it, these are some good good suggestions about how to modify support your assessments in order to get that four and five that you'd like to get on your FTPA even though we're not expecting it but no pressure <laughs> yes uh -huh. Everything will be available, and that's why I make sure I got everybody's email addresses before you leave so I can send you all the materials. Okay. Okay. <coughs> I'm taking a picture of myself. Okay. 
Task 2, Rubric 6 and 7. So in Task 2, Promoting a Positive Learning Environment, I have to tell you, um, the elementary scores are good, but in Task 2, guys, they're flat. That means we've not had any improvement in Task 2 over the past six years. <laughs> we're, just, we're doing fine, but we're not getting up there. So um, I think that's because we need to talk more about Task 2 uh, before they do Task 1. And so we're, we're going to do that. Guys, don't worry. It's going to happen. Uh, how, if you think about, it's not just showing respect for and rapport with students. Look at this part. Responsiveness to students with varied needs and backgrounds and challenging students to engage in learning. So it's not just about having the re respect and rapport piece. In order to get higher, to get the four and the five, you've got to have video evidence of that. Video evidence. Um, engaging students, describe how your instruction links students' prior learning and personal cultural community assets with the new learning. So it's important to remember to, in order, this is all comes from task two, prompt two A, is where that comes from. All in that one little place. And that's where the scores go to look. It could be written somewhere else. It needs to be there in Task 2, Prompt 2A. But you'll get that. Candidate provides challenging learning environment that promotes mutual respect among students. Rubric 7. Promoting a positive, you can look at Rubric 7 in your um, rubric handout. Promoting a positive learning environment. Uh, response again. There's that personal, cultural, community assets. When there's a line, that means you've got to do both with equivalents. Notice the word engaged, deepen, extend. All this comes from the video evidence that you describe in 3B. Now this kind of gives you an idea of what you need to be doing. The teacher will, what's happening what the teacher does? It's shrinking. It's the incredible shrinking teacher. Because as you release the gradual release responsibility model, you're doing less, the students are doing more, and they're needing less support. The part of your lesson that task two comes from is in here. Where the student is working with some guidance from you and help and prompting and engaging and some support. They aren't completely doing it on their own and you aren't completely doing it. So this is the part that we're looking for in task two. So, if I was giving a lecture on the causes of the Civil War, we might take notes and to support them, I have guided notes. It's the kind of thing you put in your lesson plan. I'm going to monitor, I'm going to have them work in groups. I'm going to monitor and provide feedback. Here's their supports. Working in a group is a support. Their textbook is a support. Graphic organizers, anything, ask yourself, what are they using to help themselves? Are you giving them to help? This is in your lesson plan. It doesn't look like that. It looks like that. This right here, the part that most of you ignore or scrimp on because I've seen your lesson plans <laughs> and I am not not surprised our task two scores are flat because you're 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 thinking about what you're doing I I I I I I I teacher drill teacher will teacher will teacher will and over here it says the student will listen <laughs> 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 Yeah. Okay, and some of my students, because they want to, you know, some of my students, students will actively listen. No. <laughs> Don't 
give me that. You need to tell how the students are engaged. And if you've got too much of that student will listen here, then that's how you're making low scores on the two, on the test two. And this right here, these supports, this is where everybody gets here and they say, oh, well, how do you find before it's IEP? And you blah, 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 they completely forgot. We saw all that stuff we've said about struggling readers and academic gaps and all that other stuff. It's all out their brain. Was there a question? Um, in the students do section, could you say something like uh, the students will think pair share after or after at strategic points in the lesson or something like that? Where are they? You're planning them. This needs to be very well planned because you're going to videotape and you want to know what part of your videotape is going to be the golden needles in the haystack. Um, I've, I've always written my lesson plans like this. I don't know if this is something that the NTPA will look for, but when I say like the teacher will um, directly in the next box, I say kind of how the students will respond to what I'm doing. Or and what they're going, doing when, when you're with, doing it. Yeah, yes. so I kind of line it up, like with what Perfect. I do and what they do when I do it. And don't forget this part. Yes. Yeah. Now, do you have to have support with every single thing they do? No. Of course not. But there should be, with any kind of learning task, you should be thinking about how they need, might need support. But will they, will they look for it to be lined up? Does that just make it this easier? actually is a support artifact. For, for uh, the lesson planning is very important to help you know what to do well in task two and to do well in your commentary for task one. They don't actually grade the lesson plan. It is a support document. Okay. Yeah. And it helps you do better on the actual document that they do grade, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Rubrics 10 and 15, analyzing teaching effectiveness and using assessment to inform instruction. These are very much alike, but they are different. Um, this one is 10. Candidates propose changes that address individual and collective learning needs. So, as you'll see, to get a three, proposing changes for students' collective learning needs related to the central focus, they've added in individual and collective. So to get a four, that's considered to be more than proficient. So changes are proposed for this learning segment that will address individual learning needs. That's why a lot of people are not making above a three on that rubric. Uh, rubric 15, next steps provide targeted support to individuals or groups to improve their learning to at least one of the following, and that would be your content specific language right here. This is an art one. That's how you get the four. It does. There is a requirement here for next steps to be connected to research and theory. However, at this point, it strengthens your argument. It is not the main thing. It's listed here as a secondary criteria. The first is this. So just having that is not going to cut it, is my point. Okay? You've got to talk about individual group supports. It's the most important thing you do. Analyzing teaching, rubric 10 is scored from prompt two, that's good, task two, prompt 5A. And the, no matter what it says in the handbook, if you look at the understanding rubric level progressions, it is very clear that the evidence does not have to come from the video. And I think that's what some people keep looking for, a video clip that's got all this good stuff and something they did wrong. When actually, they don't have to find that. They can discuss from that same lesson, something else that didn't go well. But that's a that's next FDPA workshop. Rubric 15, using assessment to inform instruction. So you're looking for next steps that are going to not only address the whole class, but also for the three focus students and not or, but and individuals and groups with specific needs. Assessment. This is where it's all over the place. Rubrics 11 through 15, they have to analyze patterns of learning 
for the whole group, individuals, and groups. They had to provide individualized feedback. And remember, feedback is not good job. Feedback is very specific about why it was a good job. They need to provide support for individuals that leads directly to their understanding and use of the feedback. And next steps. This rubric 13 is something the elementary needs improvement on and secondary too. That one's hard. Describe next steps of instruction that address the needs of the whole class, individuals, and groups. So as you can see, it's everywhere. If you're not, if you're not addressing specific needs of individuals and groups, and if you're not, if you're not doing that in your NTPA, you're not going to make above a three on anything. And this is, we need to get more focus of this uh, in our classes, I think. So our task three, prompt one C, they're going to be looking at quantitative and qualitative patterns for individuals or groups. Explain how feedback, this is rubric 12, for the three focus students addresses their individual strengths and needs. So you can see it's just all the way through the assessment document too support and uh, uh, how you're going to support them in understanding their use and feedback for their strengths or weaknesses and here it's strengths and weaknesses so we've talked a lot about a lot of things faculty this is for you first of all don't assume that our students are going to get what they need in one semester course of special education first of all it's a a course that they take early and they spend most of their time discussing exceptional types of learners and not how to actually deal with these learners in a regular classroom setting so it's just not enough it's got to be in each of our classes we need to stop making differentiation this scary horrible thing that only special education people can discuss because I can tell you it's not only special education people that are teaching these students anymore resource teachers are just that resource the regular the regular classrooms is where they are um, we need to the, use the word supports um, I still use differentiation a lot because I have a master's in special ed and that's just all the time that's what comes out of my mouth but using the word supports is less intimidating and is actually um, more descriptive of what they want them to come up with um, you need to talk about supports for learning in each course. Consider that for every activity that you have students create, require them to include a variety of supports for a variety of learners. You may already be doing that. That's great. Don't let them scrimp on that last, if you're a supervisor, that last column. If they're not writing enough or if they're writing the same thing over and over and over again, make them redo it that's not sufficient uh, we need to have a zero tolerance for any assertion that everybody in a classroom is alike and there does not need to be any type of support modification or differentiation even when there's tracking even in an advanced placement class everybody is a different learner so there's differences um, mentors, supervisors, if you can encourage mentors to discuss their reasoning behind their choices of materials and strategies, that would be fantastic. At the, the ones that I've seen do that, they're, it shows, it really shows with their uh, teacher candidates. And supervisors, if you find that your students aren't doing well, a good question you can ask is how could you have better supported your students on this activity I was observing and noticed that there's your students struggle with this how could you better how could you have better supported them what could you do better next time because these are some critical thinking to get them to think about what kind of supports they can add in next time to help all their learners 
but beyond that, it's good practice for them for that they can be able to do better on some of these prompts. And that's a lot of information about a lot of rubrics. And it can be confusing, but if you have questions, now's a good time for that. Yes? Some of these supports that students might not know if their supports are not, you know, they might have questions about them. You know, because like in mathematics, you know, you have a lot of things that are, you know, the Venn diagram, but a lot of manipulatives. To me, those are called supports. Yes, they are. Yes. So sometimes yes, I think students are not aware of yes. what's actually considered. So I think we get down to the essential question, mm -hmm. what am I using to help my learners to with the content, the process, or the product? And if it's manipulatives, that's a support. Well, I find that sometimes, often, in fact, you really need things in their lessons, but don't connect them explicitly to student needs. Exactly. I'll give you an example. They will have a video or audio, and I say, well, okay, why are you using that? Well, my students really like videos. And it's like, we don't care if they like them. We do not. I'm using the video because my students engage well and learn well from yeah. video and my struggling readers learn better from video and audio than they do from text. Yeah. And so people are kind of doing good things. That's exactly right. And you say, think, why? Okay. So it's just like the That's differentiation like party. Yeah. <laughs> When you're having a party, do you just put out one kind of food and... I can't eat tomatoes. Yeah, so you have to have stuff for the gubbins that come along. And really picky about everything. And then you got me, who will eat anything as long as it's not alive. And... <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just really often comes down to common sense. Picking up the remote control that the old person dropped um, and helping people, supporting them. Any other questions? That's uh, 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 I have one patron. Uh, I have a class, for example, hepatology about liver. <laughs> about liver? Uh, liver, liver. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for example, there are, uh, there are about 30 students. Uh, in the class, some of them want to uh, want to be a doctor later. So the uh, when uh, after I collect collect the, the students' information, I find some students want to be doctor later. So they want to be learn deeply. Uh, for example, this is uh, the book. They want to uh, some knowledge behind the book. Uh, and uh, some other students uh, just want to uh, just want the teacher teaching all the books. Uh, they will see, wow! If you don't teach uh, follow the book, why you ask us to buy it? It's so expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is: uh, after I collected the information, uh, I find more difficult sometimes yeah you still let them have the book <laughs> they need to have the book because it's the supplemental that's how you're extending there it's an enrichment or extension of, on what you're doing in class so yeah but you know that I mean it, it sometimes you have to explain that it's just like what Dr. Hogan was saying just you know really thinking about why is this there and explaining that to the learners and and then that would be of course in your commentary are there any other questions? Yes. Can you give me an idea of what, I'm thinking about the rubric on supervising. Knowing your learnings, exactly what needs to be in there, because most of my students are just saying, we studied this two days ago, and they have a knowledge of blah, blah, blah. That's not what that is, right? So, it is to some degree. Some, some degree. Yeah. So what they need to be thinking about is this lesson, 
and how does this lesson apply? I mean, how what what prerequisite skills, what prerequisite content do they need for this lesson? So, but they need to make good connections. They also need to think about their students' personal assets, their interests, their community, and and describe the things that they know about their students that are pertinent to this lesson. So they can't just copy and paste each time from yeah. what they've done before. That it's also, did every single student learn that? Pardon? Did, uh, we covered this, I love that, covered this two yeah. days ago. Well, did they all learn it? Yes, probably not. Mm -hmm. How do you know, did, you see what I'm saying? Right. It's kind of like we, we did it, we did it, we did it. Well, so? Did they learn it? Did they all learn it? Did your struggling reader learn it? And how do you know? Does that make sense? Secondary people are real big on covering it. We yeah. covered it. Yeah. All they have to do is just give the lecture and magically everyone's going to learn the material. We did that yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Now would this be a place where you explain a certain student and what you're doing to support them? Would that be in knowing your learners? Yeah. That supporting individual students needs to be in that instructional Just, support column. Yeah, I know that. Would you identify in that knowing your learners? Two times in my class? Or yeah, I mean, you've got, yeah, I think the IEPs, I, I, I just, I can't really remember what's on the rubric for that, what all needs to be listed, yeah. but I would just refer to it. But the connections need to be strong to what they're teaching is the important thing. Okay. For NTPA, that's what we're thinking about. Anything else? November 16th, I'm going to be talking about Task 2. And I really hope people will come because this is a, this is a college-wide need. And um, it could be, I, I don't think we're turning out educators that don't know how to engage students. But I think we might be turning out educators that don't know how to write about their engagement of students <laughs> or how to, uh, how to show that in their lesson places. So that's what we'll do on, on November 16th. Thank you so much for coming. I will send you the links to all this. I just need the green sheets of paper. What time on the 16th? 1 o'clock.